Um, so what I'm talking about today, as opposed to many of the other talks in this workshop, is not so much uh, the work that has been done in my group over the last 15 years, rather the work that I plan to do over the next 15 years. Um, and uh, since catalytic applications have only been talked about in a very peripheral sense over this, uh, the course of this workshop, it not being the focus, I thought I would uh, give a little bit of a background uh, to fundamental catalytic uh, applications. First of all, I want to mention the people in my group. Uh, we're a very small and humble group for the time being. Uh, Sarika, Daria, Eliran, and Gil, who are working uh, together with me in order to devise catalytic materials in which we can manipulate the shape and the structure and the composition in order to tune catalytic activity for a specific application. So first, what is a catalyst? For those not familiar, a catalyst is a material that can increase the rate of a chemical reaction by reducing its free energy barrier and without itself being consumed. And we see catalysis in almost every industrial application you can think of, not to mention devices that you use every day, such as your car. For instance, the most common is a catalytic converter in your car who is charged with converting carbon monoxide that has not been oxidized by your engine into carbon dioxide before it comes out the tailpipe. Carbon monoxide, of course, being much more toxic than carbon dioxide. Another example of use of a catalyst is in fuel cells or electrolyzers. Uh, in a fuel cell, the idea is to put in chemical energy in order to get out electrical energy. And in an electrolyzer, we're doing the exact opposite. We're taking electrical energy, ideally from some sort of renewable resource, and we're using it in order to make um, chemicals with value-added product. And it's the latter that I'll be speaking about mostly today. So the catalytic community for the last 50 years, in my words, has been plagued with what I'll call guess and check methodologies in which we take an array of compositions and we screen through them using some process and whatever happens to be the best, we retroactively try to explain why this catalyst was the best. And I think moving forward, uh, uh, this is something that we're gonna try to overcome in our laboratory by doing rational or intelligent design of catalysts. But in order to do this, I wanted to break down the general strategy, the general fashion in which a catalyst works as a way to preface the materials that we're going to design. So the first way a catalyst can work is by helping to initiate a reaction by causing or by creating a radical or free electrons or some uh, in a, a more highly active state uh, to initiate the reaction, generally done by breaking a bond. Uh, the next is to stabilize intermediates. Uh, most of the reactions that we speak about in energy conversion are not single step, rather they're multi-step, and you need to maintain a high concentration of intermediates in order to have a meaningful conversion to products. So the more stable your intermediate, the more, at least kinetically, you're able to drive your reaction towards products. Third is to hold reactants together in the proper configuration. We learn this a lot from biological catalysts or enzymes that are able to take molecules, gas phase, liquid phase, what have you, and hold the uh, molecule in its proper geometric configuration uh, with proximity to another reactant required for the reaction. And this greatly increases the reaction speed simply by holding two molecules in proximity to one another. What we'll find is that we can also do this with engineered metal surfaces and nanoparticles. Next is to block side reactions. This is playing games with kinetics. Sometimes in catalysis, let me rephrase, all the time in catalysis, you have reactions that you want to accelerate, but you'll also have side reactions that are not favorable. And part of the job of a catalyst is to be engineered to be as selective as possible to the catalyst, uh, I'm sorry, to the product that you're most interested in, while at the same time blocking side unwanted reactions. This can be done by playing games with kinetics and composition, and as I'll hope to show, structure. Next is to stretch bonds. Stretching bonds makes them easier to break. And finally, <laughs> donate and accept electrons and assist with the transfer of energy. So keeping these motifs in mind, we're going to move forward. Um, just one quick example, uh, the palladium uh, FCC111 surface is particularly good 
for uh, benzene ring decomposition. The reason why it's so good is because the interatomic spacing of the palladium molecules in this arrangement matches very nicely with the carbon-carbon triple bond. So again, holding your reactants in the right orientation in the right place is really one way to design an efficient catalyst. So in catalysis, we also have what's called Sabatier's principle. I talk about a lot about binding and absorption and desorption, and really the key is to hit a middle ground. Sabatier's principle says your catalyst and its relationship to the binding strength of the reactant, it can be neither too strong nor too weak. If the interaction is too strong, you'll absorb your uh, reactant, you'll even see reaction, but you'll never get your product off of the surface which is impractical. And obviously, if the interaction is too weak, uh, the lifetime of your reactant on the catalyst surface is too short in order to see um, reasonable reaction rates. So obviously, we want to find uh, the middle ground. And this gives rise to what a lot of us call volcano plots. I'll use an example of hydrogen evolution, which is something used a lot uh, in energy conversion devices, almost ubiquitously. And what we have plotted here is the metal hydrogen bond uh, strength in kilocalories per mole on the x-axis. And on the y-axis, we have the logarithm of the exchange current density, which is a measure of the kinetic uh, feasibility of the reaction. And what we see on these different metals that as the metal hydrogen bond uh, increases, the rate of reaction will also increase up until a certain point. And it's at this certain point where you start getting diminishing returns, which is to say the strength of the metal hydrogen bond is increasing so much that it's actually causing the rate to come back down again. What I'll draw your attention to is a few things. First of all, platinum being near the top of the peak, which is why platinum is used so ubiquitously in these reactions. What I'd also like to draw your attention to is the presence of rhenium in almost the same position, and this will become relevant in a few minutes. Also, large changes in rate with catalysts. This is not uh, chemical reactor design where you're talking about single or doubly ordered magnitude changes in rates. Rather, with a catalyst compared to the absence of a catalyst, in some cases we can talk about changes in rate up to 10 to the 40. Uh, the examples here are not as big, we're talking 10 to the 13, but still significant changes in rate uh, in the presence of a catalyst. And this comes down to our uh, typical Arrhenius expression where the rate constant is changed with the negative activation energy. And this goes into some functional uh, rate law, which is uh, extremely diverse depending on the reaction you're looking at. But by playing these games, by using a catalyst, we're able to see enhancement um, that uh, can bring a reaction that's almost invisible uh, at, uh, in the absence of a catalyst to um, uh, significant reaction rates that are of importance to industry in the presence of the catalyst. Catalysts can come in different forms. In our lab, we're going to look at both of these forms. The first, supported powders, generally an active metal phase dispersed about um, an oxide or a perovskite, and these can be milled and formed into different shapes and loaded into reactors. And also of equal interest is uh, structured catalysts, wires, mats, fibers, and cloths, and they both have advantages and disadvantages. So now that we've had a few minutes to talk about catalysts, I'm going to talk about a few different uh, energy conversion catalytic reactions that are relevant for my laboratory, namely the conversion of methane, carbon dioxide, and oxygen into value-added products and the associated problems with these different catalytic reactions. So the first uh, that I'll talk about is what's called gas-to-liquid uh, catalysis of methane. This is where we want to take gas phase methane and do what is effectively a polymerization reaction, although it's not quite that simple, to make liquid fuels as using methane uh, being the feed source of our energy demand once we pass peak oil, which should be in about 40 years. So uh, this has regional interest uh, with the discovery of the Vietan and Tamar, which are uh, natural gas pockets that are found right off the coast of Israel. Um, but the idea is, because many of these gas pockets are found far offshore, it's impractical in many different ways to use conventional techniques to bring gas phase methane back to land in order for it to be reformed and utilized. I should mention that if you were to add up all the methane that is underneath the seabed the worldwide power consumption compared to the amount of methane that is buried underneath the seabed, we can run our 
cities, we can meet our energy demands for the next thousand years. This in comparison to, to oil, uh, it means methane is a, a reasonable competitor to replace our energy demands after peak oil. But again, the problem is how do you, how do you utilize it? The methane is very far away. So two alternatives that aren't too bright in my opinion. The first is a large pipeline. We're dealing with uh, pipelines nowadays that are a few kilometers offshore. They're narrow in diameter. And uh, they're used for smaller uh, energy demand applications. But to build a large pipeline that goes out hundreds of kilometers offshore presents a lot of engineering dangers, particularly sea depth. This means to build it or if something should go wrong, you can't send divers. Rather, you have to send robots. And this is a significant challenge for a pipeline that has high pressure flammable gas in it. The next is to cool uh, methane below its melting, um, sorry, below its boiling point, which is about minus 164 centigrade. And this is possible using cryogenic technology. But again, as you can imagine, on such a large scale that we're trying to achieve here, meeting the global energy demand, uh, achieving this is just impractical because all the cryogenic materials and the, the special containers and the special boats, not very practical. So we introduce now gas to liquid catalysis which is a way of taking uh, methane and converting it into multi-carbon alkane chains, octane, something that you could put into your car. Uh, this way you can put these uh, multi-carbon alkanes into traditional vessels, into traditional boats that can come back to land, and we can use our current infrastructure in order to maintain our energy uh, demands. What I'm going to talk about now is a very interesting reaction environmentally, which is dry reforming of methane, in which we use carbon dioxide as the oxidizing agent in order to make a mixture of carbon monoxide and hydrogen. This mixture can be adjusted to the ratio of 2 to 1 hydrogen to carbon dioxide, which is known as synthesis gas. It's known as synthesis gas because these are the building blocks for liquid fuels. You have all the atoms you need, namely carbon, oxygen, and hydrogen, to make your alkane. I should mention this last reaction is called fischer trott synthesis, and it's a very well-known reaction. It's been very well optimized over the last 50 years. It's rather the methane cracking reaction that requires the most technological advancement, and this is going to be what the focus of our catalytic advancements will be. So the question is, this is the reaction we're interested in. What is the most appropriate catalyst? Obviously, we want high specific surface area, very active atomic centers, and what is most key, resistance to carbon deposition. We see here two alternative pathways that carbon monoxide and methane can take on the surface, leaving behind solid carbon. This, pro this process is called coking, and this is the primary reason why methane dry reforming is not industrialized today. You have very, very active catalysts that can do industrially relevant rates, but they all suffer from coking. They have short lifetimes, and uh, this carbon deposition in many cases is not reversible. So what we're interested in developing is coke-resistant catalytic surfaces in order to industrialize methane dry reforming. Because it's great. You kill two birds with one stone. You take methane, carbon dioxide, two very low-value products, uh, both greenhouse gases, and you're able to make value-added products from. Again, high throughput, cheap and reproducible being obvious uh, constraints that we want to idealize. I mentioned before there are two types of structures we can look in the long shot. High surface area, obviously powders are generally known to have surface areas of tens to hundreds even, meters squared per gram, and on the fibers you're generally in order to have magnitude lower than that. Um, other things that we're looking for is resistance to sintering, which is to say uh, recrystallization and the bringing together of active centers. I'm sorry. Uh, which effectively decreases your active surface area, as shown here. This is generally done at high temperature due to uh, diffusion of active sites at the high temperatures. And again, high throughput and control and reproducibility being obvious constraints of ours. So I mentioned to remember rhenium, and this is work that we're doing in collaboration with Noam Elias and Elias Aguiladi here at Tel Aviv University. Um, to look at rhenium as a active catalytic center for this reaction, having possible coke-resistant activities. I should mention the number one use for rhenium is in aerospace. Uh, rhenium is a refractory metal, so we have a lot of temperature and oxidative re resistant coatings that the aerospace industry is interested in. But I should also mention that the second use is for fuel reforming. And despite its use in fuel reforming, um, there are less than 10 papers that have been out to study uh, rhenium and dry methane reforming. 
and uh, not a lot is known about its possible advantages, but let's first think why it might be advantageous in the first place. I mentioned these are our two side reactions that we'd like to inhibit, and the inhibition is largely going to be kinetic. For instance, nickel, which is great at uh, methane dry reforming, uh, shows a relatively low activation barrier for uh, the disproportionation of carbon monoxide leading to carbon. However, a significantly higher activation barrier is found on platinum. And this is the idea where we're talking about changing the composition in order to play kinetic games. So our question is, would we expect rhenium to perform similar, more similar to platinum or nickel? And one thing that we can look at is the heat of absorption of the relevant species involved in the reaction. So for instance, polycrystal and platinum and polycrystal and rhenium show almost the same heat of absorption for carbon monoxide and hydrogen, which is an indication that uh, rhenium would perform similar to platinum. Uh, which could perform as a coke-resistant catalyst, but we obviously want to minimize our use of platinum. And despite rhenium still being a rare metal, its price is about a third of platinum currently on the market. So what we're looking at in our laboratory are structured catalysts. These catalysts have a support of a stainless steel mesh wire, and on this stainless steel mesh wire, we deposit a rhenium alloy. I'm calling it a rhenium alloy for the time being because uh, the other elements of the alloy, um, it's still in publication and uh, we're keeping it hush hush. So we're having uh, this uh, rhenium alloy that's electrodeposited. This is not the active phase, rather a precursor. We do vacuum annealing in addition to a, a few other uh, thermal treatments. And what this does is there are volatile phases, nickel oxides, nickel hydroxides, including rhenium oxide, by the way, which has a non-zero volatility at uh, our temperatures. And what we get in result, not this nodular surface, but rather this very porous surface from the top down. It almost looks like a metal sponge, which is very intriguing because this means we can come up with a very highly conductive film that can have a surface area much higher than simply the mesh, maybe not as high as a powder, but this highly conductive film that has what I'll call an intermediate surface area due to its porosity is very intriguing. Also, the fact that it's a rhenium alloy um, metal foam or a metal sponge, if you will, uh, it, it's uh, quite a novel material that we're very interested in measuring. And what we uh, do is we put it inside of our uh, reaction chamber and we're measuring for methane and carbon dioxide conversion using gas chromatography. So this is the cross section of that same material, Again, or I'm sorry, this is the top down version of that same material. We see this very porous, foamy metal structure that we've put on top of the stainless steel fibers, which is very nice. And this is a cross section of that same material. What's interesting, right here is the interface between the stainless steel and the coating. What's interesting and still not explained, it's work in progress, is why the porosity is much more dense in the layer adjacent to the stainless steel um, wire as opposed to further away. Up here is where we're seeing the porosity, but as we go down into our film, we see that there's a non-uniform distribution of pores uh, that's dependent on depth, and this is still something that we're investigating, and we're going to do various um, TEM and SEM studies uh, with mapping of elemental uh, contributions and different uh, investigations to see what are the structural differences between these two lamella, which could be causing this, um, not segregation, but the, the two different uh, densities of pores. But nevertheless, we have what turned out to be a very active catalyst towards methane dry reforming. What I have here on the y-axis is the single pass methane conversion. And on the x-axis, I have the time on stream, and I'm changing the temperature. This does a few things. First of all, it allows me to calculate an activation energy if I'm interested. But also, what it allows me to do is to see how the thermodynamic reactions that I'm interested in subduing are changing as I alloy the catalyst. So for example, at 750 degrees C, we see only a marginally um, higher contribution for methane conversion when we alloy the catalyst with either 1.5 or 5.4% atomic, of course, uh, rhenium into the film. And again, at 800, only these marginal differences. But when the temperature is reduced to 700 degrees C, we see a significant change in the methane conversion. 
the unalloyed catalyst is down at around 30%, and the alloyed catalyst is about twice that. And what this tells me, since over here it's only marginal, and at 700 degrees, um, the, the gap is much wider, this means that there is coke um, inhibition that's forming on the surface, because at 700 degrees C, uh, coke formation is more thermodynamically favored. And because it's more thermodynamically favored at lower temperatures, we'd expect to see this sort of catalyst death from the red uh, triangles that we see in the unalloyed catalyst. But in the alloyed catalyst, when we drop to 700 C, um, we don't see not nearly as much of a drop. And uh, this could be indicative of the fact that rhenium is an effective uh, doping material to imbue coke resistance and methane dry reforming. What's also of interest is what's called the gas hourly space velocity. Briefly, it is the amount of gas that one gram of catalyst sees in an hour. So a gas hourly space velocity of 8,000 means that one gram of catalyst sees 8,000 milliliters of gas in one hour. And this is a way of standardizing your comparison between different gas phase catalysts. Um, we're operating at a gas hourly space velocity of about 8,000, which compared to powdered catalysts is a little low. Powdered catalysts will generally run experiments closer to 20,000, but this is due to their higher surface area. They can process more gas. What we see here is that as the gas hourly space velocity is increased to values that are typically done for powders, let's say, as opposed to metal meshes, uh, the the single pass conversion of methane drops significantly. But in the higher regime, it drops in a linear region, in, in a linear fashion, which means our surface is extremely active, but it's also saturated. It doesn't matter how much more methane you pass over the surface, all the active sites are taken up. There is, you can't further increase the activity of these catalysts unless you change the geometry or the surface area. Nevertheless, we see that we have an extremely resistant catalyst that can perform at the same level as a powder if only its geometry can be changed. I should mention that this is significant because nowadays people don't talk about using metal meshes and fibers and cloths as catalysts, not nearly as much as they talk about using powders. This is a consideration of surface area. So the fact that we've developed a metal structure that's highly conductive, that has a surface area likely one or two orders of magnitude lower than a powder, yet can perform at about half the performance, so less than an order of magnitude difference, this is significant in the field of catalysis. And we're going to be doing BET measurements in the, the near future so that I can uh, quantify that last remark. Also, what's in, um, of interest is the stability. Over time, we see a little bit of what we presume is an initial oxidation from carbon dioxide. But over 50 hours, which is considered to be a significant amount of time in a laboratory, we see relative stability of methane conversion. We are also looking at powders and how we can modify these powders, namely perovskites and pyrochlores, in order to also imbue coke resistance for methane conversion. And there's a few different techniques we're going to utilize, mostly substitution and shape control. I should mention that the substitution will also be uh, rhenium, but the other types of substitutions can be uh, promoters, for instance, potassium and sodium, which can donate electrons to active sites in order to decompose carbon dioxide more easily. The fact that a lot of perovskites have a high oxygen mobility could be a method to oxidize solid carbon off the surface and resist uh, coking. But in order for the oxygen to be replenished into the lattice, we need to have a faster rate of carbon dioxide dissociation. And also, we can play around with poisons in order to uh, selectively block side reactions. We can also play shapes with perovskites, exposing different crystallographic orientations uh, by shape control. I'm going to jump ahead to my next project, because I've spent a little more time than I wanted to on the first one. I'll spend a few minutes talking about the surfaces we want to develop for oxygen reduction. Oxygen reduction is an extremely relevant reaction for almost any um, fuel cell application in which we take oxygen and we uh, reduce it to water uh, using, obviously, a catalyst. The problem is that the kinetics of this reaction are extremely slow. And even though thermodynamics would predict the voltage of the uh, cathode being 1.22 volts, in practice, we usually see this reaction between 0.7 and 0.9 volts. And it's this kinetic barrier that's leading to this drop 
uh, uh, which is effectively an overpotential. Right now, platinum is used. And what we want to do is we want to design materials that are not platinum uh, to drive down the cost of fuel cells. But platinum is the most active. Now, not only is platinum the most active, but different crystallographic orientations of platinum show different responses for oxygen reduction. So even though platinum is an extremely active catalyst, it's highly dependent on the crystallographic orientation. So what we want to do is we want to take the same idea, this dependence on crystallographic orientation, or facet engineering, if you will, and apply it to less noble metals, even transition metals, in order to find the most active planes uh, for oxygen reduction as a way of replacing the catalyst from platinum to other uh, metals. So the, the key question is, can we increase oxygen reduction activity of non-platinum metals by controlling microstructure? And the answer is what we hope, yes. First of all, we can change the microstructure of the synthesis um, by changing the synthesis of various surfaces. Uh, for instance, uh, different surfaces, particularly basal planes of, let's say, nickel or palladium, their, uh, nuclei, uh, their nuclei have different activation energies. So by changing pulse electrodeposition constants like the, the pulse potential or the pulse currents to more and more negative uh, voltages, we're able to stimulate the growth of selectively oriented surfaces. For example, in a nickel-palladium alloy, which we'd like to test, by playing games with pulse electrodeposition, we can talk about having selectively oriented 111, 100 and 110 uh, alloys, and we can test these alloys for oxygen reducting reactivity. What's interesting is in the literature, this type of technique of faceting has been largely done with pure metals and much less understood in alloy, um, in alloy systems. And because it's less understood in alloy systems, in many cases, these alloy systems have not been tested for catalytic sensitivity, and that's exactly what uh, we want to do. I'll remind you also of the benzene example, where if we're changing the crystallographic orientation by pulse plating or other techniques, we're effectively changing interatomic bond distances. And if we tune the bond distances right, it can either inhibit or enhance the adsorption of relevant molecules, namely hydroxide and oxygen, in the case of oxygen reduction. We've employed a similar technique uh, during my PhD, where we uh, changed particle size using an ionic liquid electrolyte in order to convert carbon dioxide into carbon monoxide. And by changing the um, crystallography via the, uh, via the particle size, we see what is mostly likely a volcano plot increasing current of carbon dioxide reduction as we decrease the uh, nanoparticle size down to five nanometers. Then once we hit one nanometer, we see a decrease in activity, again, like the volcano plot I showed you at the beginning of this presentation. So looking for an explanation of this behavior, the first thing we looked for is, uh, is there a significant change in uh, nearest neighbors? Are we making low coordinated sites? And the answer, based on synchrotron analysis, is that uh, the difference between bulk silver and one nanometer silver, as far as the coordination, is about a 6% difference. FCC silver with 12 nearest neighbors, this comes to less than an atom difference. Uh, so we can't attribute what is effectively a tenfold change in activity to less than an atom. But what we can look at is uh, electronic and thermodynamic effects. The work function of different sized particles, not a significant difference, certainly not a volcano activity like we see in uh, the carbon dioxide conversion. But what we do see is the thermodynamic effect that these different sites, the, the, these different crystallographic orientations based on particle size have uh, different adsorption energies. And we can test this using sulfate or hydroxide, and we can measure the overpotential of uh, the adsorption as a measure of the strength of binding. And by manipulating this, we were able to explain what is effectively a tenfold change in rate based on crystallographic effects. So as I mentioned earlier, we can get different types of selective orientation in different metallographic alloys simply by switching from a DC convention to a pulsed convention. And there's a few different mechanisms that are circulating in the literature to explain why you would get a, a different selective uh, preferred orientation when you apply a pulse of a different strength or of a different frequency, this being an example of uh, uh, 
something that we have uh, submitted a few weeks ago. We're looking at uh, nickel alloys and how the depth of the pulse affects the uh, microstructure and texture of the resulting deposit. Also, electrochemical faceting via selective etching is also a very nice technique. Uh, on, the, on the left, we see work done a few months ago by Horton, where he looks at uh, uh, EBSD as a way of seeing which grains are selectively etched to make these faceted surfaces. And we see very slow etch rates on the, the corners of the stereographic triangle. And when you get to about 20 to 40 degrees from either 111, 100, or 110, we see a much faster etching rate. And this a way of modifying the surface to expose different crystallographic planes for, um, uh, for catalysis work. So one other technique I'd like to speak about before I finish is what's called scanning electrochemical microscopy, which is a way similar to STM where you can uh, use a probe in order to look at local catalytic activity, particularly for oxygen reduction activity. And what people have done in the past very nicely is to make these uh, dots of different compositions. They're making alloys. And they can scan the tip over the different compositions as a way of high throughput screening for alloys and electrocatalysis. What we want to do is we want to take this a step further. We want to do this technique. But instead of changing composition with respect to position on the electrode, we want to change the microstructure. And what we find is this could be possible with a whole cell type device where the working electrode and the counter electrode are held at some angle with respect to another, which is to say they're not parallel. This means the primary current distribution will be dependent on distance between the counter electrode and the working electrode, which means we can apply effectively a different current distribution that's dependent on the position. And as I showed a few slides ago, the structure is dependent on the current density. So what we're talking about here is using a technique that could possibly give us rapid screening, not of ideal composition, but of ideal structure for uh, electrocatalysis. And I think this will make some very interesting work. Right now, we have a BSF proposal in collaboration with MIT in order to uh, realize this. So I would like to thank uh, you for your attention, and I'd be happy to take any questions that you have. Thank you, Brian. So one or two quick questions? Yeah. Go back to the silver, because I didn't quite understand what you were saying. What was your explanation for this? So what we saw was uh, a significant increase in the CO2 electroreduction as a function of as particle size. OK, so the question is, it's not just a particle size effect. We wanted to see what was the actual uh, possible cause for it. So we went through the different uh, possible explanations. The first explanation was, uh, as the particle sizes are getting smaller, is it possible that there are lowly coordinated silver atoms that have higher reactivity? And the answer, uh, according to data that we took at uh, Argonne National Lab on their synchrotron, is no. OK, yeah, so XF. So we saw a very small difference. We looked at electronic properties by comparing the work function of bulk to one nanometer particles. And we see that there's not a significant difference in the work function, uh, at least not enough to explain the large difference in catalytic activity. But what we did see is if we are doing an electrochemical experiment where we're trying to either adsorb and desorb a species, either sulfate, hydroxide, carbon monoxide, your species of choice, uh, what we see is a significant difference in the overpotential required to facilitate the adsorption and the desorption based on the particle size. And this has to do with the energy required to facilitate the absorption based on the size of the particle. What is what? I mean, is this a difference in the one over one 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 strategy you could explain to the molecular particles? So is it due to chemical potential changes? So what uh, just slightly complicated for me. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So uh, I, I can't speak to the crystallography since we didn't do XRD of the nanoparticles. Oh, so it's not a matter of crystallography, rather a matter of thermodynamics and the strain that you would see 
uh, once nanoparticles really go below five nanometers and the surface area to volume ratio is significantly different. And this is the explanation that uh, we were able to explain. Because, and, and this difference is visible if you were to look at, for example, here, we have, uh, we're looking at, yes. And this is leading to changes in adsorption and desorption of, yes. Yeah. So obviously this is a consideration we're looking to when we're talking about doping uh, molecules. There's a lot of, or sorry, uh, surfaces. There's a lot in the literature about the position of the D-band and its effect on uh, catalysis since it's widely known that the D-electrons contribute a lot to catalysis. Um, so the, the variation of the D-band that we would play with would largely come from changes in composition and the atoms that we choose to dope our surfaces with. Um, and not so much changing uh, the structural uh, or the textural aspects of our surfaces. Do you, do you change the number of active sites when you do this? So, the way, so we, when, you, when you facet a surface, there's ways to facet surfaces with changing the surface area, and there are also ways to change to facet surfaces without changing the surface area. Ideally, we want to try to change the texture of our surfaces without having large differences in surface area, because uh, this makes the comparison much more easy. But even with changes in surface area, there are a wide variety of techniques that we can do to standardize our catalytic surfaces to, to catalytically active area. Yes? So right now, the fa you're talking about the faceting of the surface? Yeah, so, so if you have a small particle, you would use the same dissolved state. And then another state, that's the biggest particle. And that's a so right now, the faceting is done at uh, room temperature. We're not doing it at elevated temperature. And the, the mechanism for the faceting, uh, we're looking at uh, the adsorption of oxygen and then throwing it into the hydrogen adsorption region, which effectively creates metal oxides and then the decomposition of those oxides, and this will lead to surface reconstructions. And there's a few other mechanisms in the literature. No, 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 not so. Different, different works, different works. Uh, this, this explanation is noble metals, mostly. Sorry, I didn't mean to confuse the two projects. Um, platinum, palladium, gold, uh, or the so-called platinum group metals. Uh, this oxide and decomposition followed by reconstruction is a very popular way of faceting. The problem, of course, is ideally we want these high facet or high index facets, uh, but in reality, <laughs> these high index facets are not particularly stable. They'll generally decompose back to basal plane. Uh, but as we showed earlier, yes, high index facets are nice, and we can look at in the future about using nanoparticles in order to confine the high index facets to the exposed surfaces. But even uh, in the 110, 111, and 100, we can look at significant effects in catalytic activity. So we don't quite need to go into the high index regime just yet, but it's something that we're definitely looking for in the future. Okay, let's thank uh, Brian again. Thank you.